There we go. Gil, welcome. It's an honor to have you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, man. Uh, she said, hey, you had a good Father's Day? Um, I, had a, I had a wonderful Father's Day, and believe me, I'm honored that I was invited to join your podcast today. Oh, I'm the one that's honored, sir. Thank you very much. Um, Gil, you had a 38-year career, 26 in homicide, and you've handled more than 400 homicide cases. Yes. That is the mental side of things. Um, I mean, that has got to be, is that, how, how mentally draining is that? Oh, it's not uh, mentally draining. It's very satisfying and rewarding when you get into the job. Yeah. The job itself, although it seems nasty and disastrously heartbreaking, uh, it's, I kind of equate it to being a surgeon. You know, a surgeon okay. goes in and everybody else sees blood and guts and they get sick. A surgeon goes in and very scientific. It's very rewarding when he fixes the human up and be, is able to tell the relatives, we've saved your loved one's life or yes. he's now got years to live. So that's the way I look at it. And you remember all the positive ones and you try to just store in the back somewhere the negative sides of it. Yeah. Um and I mean, I remember, obviously, you've, um, you know, you show up to your most famous case is the Night Stalker case, Richard Ramirez. Um, yes. I remember as a six-year-old, I was five or six, back, back in South Africa, there was, a, there was a movie that came out called Manhunt, Search for the Night Stalker. Your character was played, well, your character, not your character. You were portrayed by actor... Adolfo Martinez, who was famed. A. For, Martinez. Yeah, who was do, who was uh, famed for doing L.A. Law, Santa Barbara shows like that. And um, sure. I've got to tell you, as a six-year-old, watching watching that movie, I would never forget the name, The Night Stalk. I mean, that that to me was my version of the Boogeyman, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, my mom had to tell me, listen, it's. Um, you know, this is in America. It's far away from us. Don't worry. And for a long time, I didn't want to go to America. <laughs> uh, um, until years later, I found out that, you know, the United States also has, you know, Disneyland and uh, cool places like that. So I had a, I had a sure. bit of a love-hate perception with, with the United States, but all good. Um, yeah, the, um, the way that you know what what sets him apart from from other serial killers, you know like guys like Bundy and you know Gacy and these guys um, most serial killers they found in the past uh, have been consistent in the method of operation or with that uh, modus operandi as they yes. say in the business uh, and they have one particular they go after the same person Ted yeah. Bundy went after women yeah. You know, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer went after, you know, boys. Yeah. You know, and, and, and so the thing that made this case so difficult and made it unique is that everything we do in law enforcement uh, is predicated on criminal history. And there is nobody in criminal history that had been documented doing the things that Richard was doing. Yes. And he was so unusual because his, uh, I mean, his weapons were whatever he felt like at the time. Back then in the 80s, the FBI was categorizing serial killers as organized or disorganized. Yeah. And Richard was both. He, had, he used guns, he used knives, he used ligature strangulation, manual, manual strangulation, blunt force trauma, shod foot, uh, you name it, he used it. Mm. And his victims ranged in age from five to you know, in their uh, ladies in their 80s. Clara Hansel was 85 years old. So there is uh, just, and during the hours of darkness, during the hours of daylight, uh, it just didn't matter what you were in. And we kept quiet for a long time, the fact that he was even kidnapping kids. Yeah, yeah. He, um, he also, I mean, the guy seemed like he had a bit of an ego on him. I mean, as, as the, as he got a bit, of, I, I know killers like the Zodiac, they would taunt the police or he would taunt the police rather, um, you know, writing letters to newspapers and stuff. Um, I believe when, 
uh, information came out that he's now dubbed the Night Stalker, he actually said that to one of the surviving victims that he claimed he is the Night Stalker. Yes. Uh, he, his, to quote Richard himself, he said, uh, he told me at one time, Gil, I've got an ego that'll fill this room and I can tell you all about serial killers from the time the Romans fed the Christians to the lions to modern day serial killers. So he was a student. Well, he, he was a student of serial killers. Yes. Yeah. I yeah. mean, he, he called me uh, by name, he, Hey Gil, you know, or I'd call him rich. Yes. Yet he called my partner, Mr. Salerno, because he had, uh, he knew he had read all about Frank Salerno working on the Hillside Strangler, which was another wow. serial killer. Yeah. So he had so much respect for him. And I asked him one day, what, what's up? Are you think he's seven foot tall? And Hubbard, <laughs> you know, this guy puts on his pants just like you and I, one leg at a time, Rich. And he says, yeah, Gil, but that's Mr. Salerno. You know, he had nothing but respect for Frank. Jeez, it's 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 strange the the psyche of of um of certain people i think people also need to remember that the i mean richard ramirez the night stalker is i mean again like you say he's just a person like like, like yes. frank salerno your partner is just a person as well so was richard ramirez but it's amazing how the media can add a sort of supernatural mystique around sure. someone like him um that's it you know with the pentagrams and all that stuff um i read a, a quote that you said well it's just another religion i mean ted bundy was a christian um that's right so it's it's kind of it's it's amazing the power of the media to me sure um it, it's kind of glorified. people walk their followers their sheep it's, they yeah. need somebody to lead them and the newspaper leads them yeah and um i mean well you saw in the in the trial the uh I mean, he had a following in the trial of women that would, you know, just just flock towards him, which is oh yes, which is insane. <laughs> yeah, he had some very attractive. He had yeah. some business ladies, some attorneys that Educated were uh, women. following yeah. him. Sure. Wow. Wow. Okay. And um, and he got married. He got married to a journalist, didn't he? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Wow. There was okay. one lady. Uh, there was a young lady that followed, was there every day of preliminary hearing. Mm. And she was a young Filipina, Filipino uh, lady. And her name was Bernadette. And so after the trial was over, we, we went through preliminary hearing there here in the United States. And there was a waiting period uh, about three years before we went to actual trial. And when we got to trial, and after the trial was over, she never showed up at the trial. And I asked him, whatever happened to Bernadette? And he says, well, she kept trying to get me to go back into religion, Catholicism. Oh, yeah? I, I said, and? He says, well, I just you know let her know that wasn't going to happen. And I talked her into Last time I talked to her, she was doing porno. So <laughs> uh, I, I have no idea whatever happened to her. And it's none of my business. I didn't care. She wasn't part of yeah. the case, but it just sure. goes to show you what women or what anybody will do. Yeah. You know, I mean, Bundy, had some... Bundy had the same thing. He got married to uh, someone when he was in prison as well. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. See, and, and I don't, I don't, Richard followed all of them. Uh, I even got educated from him. I, there was uh, on one of the uh, doors, he had carved the words, Jack the knife. Yes. And I, and I asked him, what does that mean? So now he's educating me. I'd never heard of Jack the Knife. He said it was another name that they used for Jack the Ripper. Yeah. I, I, I mean, when I saw that um, in the documentary, I immediately thought of Jack the Ripper. Okay. So, so is that another name that they use for Jack the Ripper? Yes. That was just another Jack the Knife and Jack the Ripper, one of the same. It was just oh. a, na a name that they also gave it. Okay. Jeez. According to Richard. According to Richard, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, he was, I heard stories when he was in jail. I've done a lot of reading up since the last time we spoke. Um, and I've got to tell you why, why I jumped to the mental aspect of, of this uh, from the get-go of this, this podcast is this whole thing started weighing on me. <laughs> um, from a mental standpoint, 
so much so that I used to wake up in the middle of the night and, you know, I was too scared to go to the bathroom. I think, you know, you kind of just, you know, when you're involved in doing research for a podcast like this, it kind of, uh, it kind of gets to you, which is why I asked you about the mental side of things, because I mean, to you, it was 24 seven for, for over a year. Yes. Yeah. Um, so basically, the the first suspect that you guys had was also um, a gentleman who, you know, yeah, we uh, we thought he was a guy we spent an awful lot of time on. You you have to be talking about Arturo Robles. Yes. Uh, at that time, we had no idea who anybody was. You know, we're looking for somebody that wearing a certain type of clothing, has long hair, and uh, was tall, could be light skinned. Uh, Hispanic or Caucasian. Asian, yeah. And so it just so happened in one of our patrol areas, uh, the guys caught up with me and said, Hey, Gil, I took a report the other day. This gal uh, turned in some guy who said he was following her all over the place, green car. Mm. And we, we stopped him and there was nothing to it. Uh, but he gave me the information. So I got a surveillance team. I said, Follow this guy for us. And they followed him and they, they picked them up at work. They took him to work and he worked a full eight hour day, not yeah. far from where he lived. And then they took him home and they said, Gil, you know, this is a waste of time. We don't want to follow this guy. It's just a waste of time. He doesn't look or sound like what you're looking for. Yeah. And he, he has uh, real long hair. Richard's hair is not that long, comes to his shoulders. And I said, stay on him. They were doing 12 and 12. So they were going to stay on him till midnight. They, they went and they picked him up as he left for uh, a night on the town. And when he came out, uh, they later got in touch with me. And they asked if they could stay on him longer. And I said, no, we've got another team that's going to take it over now. Because what he had done is he came outside. When he came back out to go out for the night, he's wearing the exact same clothes that we were looking for. Okay. And he's got and he's gotten his hair and he's tucked it in the back of his jacket so you can't see that his hair goes down way below his shoulder blades. Right. And he's driving his BMW and he took him to a restaurant and he drove around the restaurant and waiting for the right place, the right time, and he parked when some gal came in by herself. He parked and then he ducked down between the cars. And followed her inside the restaurant. And we had cops inside the restaurant go in there, make sure that she was okay. When she came out, they she got in her car and she sensed that he was following her. So she sped off. She finally lost him, but the cops did not lose him. And he went up to Hollywood. Okay. And when he when he went up to Hollywood, where there's a lot of women up there, he went up there and the guys are telling me that. Uh, he looked at all women that were walking by themselves. And if he saw a lady that was walking by herself in the opposite direction, he'd hang illegal U-turns, almost cause accidents, anything just mm -hmm. to get by her. And he saw one get in the car and drove not even a quarter of a block before she bails out. She jumps out of the car. Okay. And then he, he goes into it and he parks in one certain area. So there were a lot of things that he was doing that looked yeah. like the guy. We finally brought him in. We showed a picture of him to uh, one of our surviving victims. Yes. And out of a six pack, she says, that looks like the guy. And then we put him in a lineup and it wasn't him. We did a search warrant on his house. We found out the guy is a perv. Mm. He was a pervert. He had women's underwear that are all sliced up in the crotch. Uh, he had any kind of picture that he could get out of uh, a catalog or just in the newspaper. Yeah, because, I mean, internet wasn't around then. Yeah, that are <laughs> modeling things. He had them all cut up and saved. And so he was a pervert, but he just wasn't my pervert. Yeah. <laughs> oh, geez. And... um. I mean, just the, uh, so that was frustrating in itself um, because obviously the thought process might be, okay, this could all be over. You know, this must be weighing on everyone's, on everyone's yeah. um, mind mentally. And um, you just want to get to the destination, which is catching the, you know, catching the killer, so to speak. 
how frustrating uh, was it when um, the the dentist? So the dentist identified, you know, you guys had a pretty good idea of who he was. The dentist said, if um, if Ramirez comes back, he'll notify you guys by pressing. I guess it's a panic button. They they did. LAPD had what you're talking about is there are jurisdictions, yes, different policing jurisdictions. Mm. The actual dentist office was in LAPD's jurisdiction. So, okay. but it's the sheriff's department that has the majority of the case. So we're working the case. So we put two guys inside the dental office. Yeah. An, an executive from the sheriff's department decided that we were wasting money because these guys were in there seven days a week, 12 mm. hours a day. The dentist was a working doc. He was a working doctor. Yeah. And so he wasn't, the executive didn't believe that he would be coming back. I knew he would be coming back because I got the x-rays and I took him to a personal friend of mine that was a dentist. And he says, Gil, he's got to come back. He's got an impact that dude, it's going to be killing him. Yeah. And he's going to have to go back. So we put him in there. And finally, the executive said, pull him out and get LAPD to put one of their robbery alarms in there. It's an alarm. Mm. And you hit it, it's a silent alarm, and it goes off directly in their off in their station right there nearby, yeah. at which time cops would be there immediately. Well, that famous night, I get a phone call from the dentist, and he's kind of upset, and he's saying, where were you? The guy came back, I kept pushing the button, nobody came. Yeah. And, and it was it was not uh, – it was more at this point in time, because of all the pressure, it wasn't frustrating. It, it, I was angry. Yeah, I can imagine. And I was, I was angry at my executives. Yeah. They're not investigators. We are. I am. And I'm doing everything possible to put this case to rest. Yeah. And they are usurping – they're using their authority and they're telling me what to do. When they've never been an investigator and they, they don't have the feel for the case, nothing. So we do that and we told the sheriff, our big boss, told him, and he said, Well, I guess that was a shitty idea. I don't know whose idea it was to pull them out. And he says, Get them back in there. So now it's like, Okay, the horse is out, put them back, you know, close the door again. Don't let anybody, and he never did come back. He, um, how difficult, you talk about different jurisdictions, um, particularly in that area, how difficult does that make police work? Uh, depending on who you're working with uh, at the time and who's, who's in charge of the department, you know, mm. executives, smaller departments. Uh, we had murders in Monterey Park. Yeah. Uh, Monterey Park handles their own murders. They're a smaller department. And they use our crime lab. Okay. And their chief of police was hell bent on cat. They wanted they wanted to get him. So they didn't want Big Brother being us, the sheriff's yeah. department, going in there and uh, t- taking away their thunder. Yes. LAPD, which is the great big department there, alongside of us, uh, at the investigative level, the two lead investigators from. Uh, robbery homicide division there with LAPD, Frank and myself, we sat down, we said, okay, look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to work the case. You guys work anything you got. We'll continue to work what we got and we will exchange information on a daily basis. Okay. We don't give a shit what the executives say, want, or do. This is not about politics and we really don't care who makes the arrest. It's just about getting this guy off the street. So it worked out great with him. Another smaller agency uh, up in uh, oh, Glendale, they were not as forthright coming forward with information that they had. And they wanted to be a part of this big investigation because, again, they're a smaller department. And uh, they then called up and said, okay, we want a surveillance team. And we said, okay, because we have surveillance teams available. What do you want to follow? Why? Are, what's our justification? What's our justification for following him? Yeah. And uh, Pearl. And he said, uh, well, I just have this gut feeling. 
well, we need more than a gut feeling, you know, to take 12 guys on a surveillance team and give them to you when we're following up leads over here. We need them available. Yeah. Because everybody has gut feelings. Yes. And so just give us a little more. And he got upset because his gut feeling was not justification enough to give him a team that they then stopped. Uh, they, they then stopped exchanging information. And when, once the guy was in custody, uh, like LAPD, everybody gave us all their paperwork and, uh, we presented the whole thing to the district attorney with the exception of Glendale. They wanted to be, they wanted to present their own case. Okay. They didn't want to give us anything. And so it was smaller departments we had problems with and the large department, we had none. And I really think other than, you know, we didn't run into the, the politics at uh, Glendale, it was the individual investigators. So individuals do things at Monterey Park, it was their chief. It was the obstacle. Okay. Um, well, speaking of politics, that definitely got in the way. And this must have, well, again, this, this probably didn't frustrate you. This probably made you extremely angry, putting it nicely, was um, Mayor Feinstein from San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, I knew where you were going with this. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Just say, segue into that into that real quick. Did she ever apologize about that? No. Really? No. No, never did. Never said anything. She's never heard from me. Uh, mm. <laughs> I've never seen her. Yeah. I, I wouldn't give her the time of day. Uh, I have absolutely zero respect for her. <laughs> and she was, a, she was a politician is what she was doing. And she released information that she had no idea what she was doing. And I remember we had just come back uh, from San Francisco when we were heading into our building, which yeah. was the Hall of Justice. And as you go into the building at that time, mm. situated on the mezzanine floor, as you had to walk up some steps, was our uh, media bureau where they yeah. monitor all television and handle the press. And one of the guys shouted out, he says, hey, Gil, you guys ought to come in here and see this. And we saw what was happening. And we walked up, we then just walked out. We were on the eighth floor, went up to the floor, up to our desk. And I told Frank, let's get out of here. You know, and, and, and I won't use the language that was used. <laughs> Feel free. But I, 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 I said, fuck this place. Fuck this case. Let's yeah. get the fuck out of here. This is, we may as well go fishing. Yeah. And so we went, we went down to the local distributor of Spiritus Fermenti. <laughs> a uh, little little bar in Chinatown there. Mm. And we went down there and started drinking and our captain uh, came in and had a, a drink with him. And we told him, you got to get to the sheriff. You got to tell him the shit's got to stop. Yeah. Please. And so he left and he called us up about 20 minutes later and he says, okay, you guys stop drinking, get yourself something to eat and be back in the office at eight o'clock tonight. Okay. And we went up there because the sheriff was holding a press conference asking all politicians, all executives to refrain from giving information out on the case. Uh, and as diplomatic as he could, he let it be known that a politician had made a very big mistake. And they should just stay out of it and leave the work for the cops. And when we got done, he said, uh, I let them know up there, if she did this again, we would embarrass her. Yeah, yeah. So and as we, well, you should. We never happened again. Yeah. Well, great. Um, because, I mean, she, uh, you guys had two key pieces of, of, um, of evidence or clues that you were working with. And that was the the uh, via uh, shoe print and the fact the fact that he, he uh, used a 22 caliber um exactly and, that, and she just leaked it all you know that for that unique shoe print that unique shoe print was so unique mm. that without equivocation i can tell you that 1356 pair of model 440 of v has arrived in new york from taiwan for yeah. distribution throughout the u.s and only six pair ended up in the state of California. One pair ended up in LA. Jeez. 
And Richard says he threw him over the Golden Gate Bridge. I was going <laughs> to ask you if you guys ever knew what happened to him. Okay, so you threw it over the Golden Gate Bridge. Yep. Oh. Yep. Thank you, Mary Feinstein. Yeah. <laughs> so um, there that you. is, I mean, uh, how far were you guys into the investigation at that stage? Uh, we were, let's see, I got the first case March the 17th. Mm. Uh, they really didn't start. It, it was a tough, tough road to hoe because uh, I was a young investigator at the time. Yes. I, I, I was the youngest guy, I believe, up there for the first seven years while I was working murders. Okay. And so when I started alleging that one man was responsible for kidnapping kids and not only little girls, but little boys yeah, and killing some victims and some others, he, he let go when I was trying. And, and there wasn't a bunch of physical evidence. There was no physical evidence other than that shoe, mm. shoe print at the time and the caliber of guns. But because he killed with different means, uh, they just felt. So many people thought that I was just a young cop trying to make a name for myself. Yeah. And so there was not the belief, there was not the support uh, really until uh, July 4th, 5th of July. And then people realized Frank and I were sent out on a case and it was our second case together. And he realized because when he saw the footprint uh, that I had been talking about on a comforter, then mm. it was it was all all questions are gone and he called the captain immediately we got a task force going on yeah. so this didn't happen in uh we didn't get the san francisco case until uh geez late july august the 8th we were down here in uh in diamond bar okay and uh so it was it was late july early august when we were up in San Francisco. All right. Okay. Jeez. And um, so what was the game plan after that? So your two key pieces of, um, you know, the, the key pieces of evidence that you were working with in trying to catch him had now been squandered. So what was the, what was the game plan now? You um, just continue, you just continue uh, working. You just keep yeah. going. And it, it's, it's, Sad to say, I had to ask uh, my partner since he had been on a serial case before. Yes. And I, I looked at him and I said, one day I said, is it wrong for me to want someone else to die? I needed him to hit again. Right. Because there's a possibility of a new piece of evidence. Yes. Because it was very difficult the way we were working it. And, uh, we had plans into effect countywide. I was sleeping, you know, a lot of people sleeping with guns. I had a gun and a police radio right next to my, right next to my bed. Yeah. So I could listen to police calls going out because there was a signal, you know, if somebody just said like uh, Viper, 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 that meant that he just hit in their area. Everybody was going to freeway on ramps, uh, blocking, looking. And so it was very, it was a very intense time. Yeah. But, if, if, you know, um, you pretty much had to start all over again because I mean, you couldn't go, you couldn't, uh, you know, in all likelihood he did. Okay. He did get rid of, in hindsight, he got rid of the Avia sneakers. Um, he probably, well, did he dump the gun as well? Uh, well, no, he did dump a gun, but we found uh, another gun. We recovered a couple of guns. Okay. So we found, we found guns that were used down here ballistically. Uh, and so we lost the shoot, but then, you know, we don't make up the stuff, you know, there's got to be another way. Mm. And he started using, uh, he started using a uh, Stadia shoe, okay. which uh, showed up and we, there was concentric circles, little dots all over the bottom of them. Okay. And so, uh, and when we went to Mission Viejo, which was a week before he was arrested, on August, he was arrested August 31st, the week before that Sunday, he had gone to uh, a uh, Mission Viejo. Mm. And when I, when I came back, uh, I found shoe prints around my house where they shouldn't have been that weren't wow. there in the morning. And so 
we then had surveillance. Uh, we then had a team set up on my house. Okay. Uh, you know, just for protection. Yeah. And by, by this time, my family was gone. Okay. Uh, they, had, they had moved out. So, and he was captured uh, that week. And was it him? Was it his, was it his shoe prints? Well, according to him, he says he knew, uh, he knew where I lived. That, he didn't tell me that. This yeah. is what okay. he told the jail deputies. Okay. So that he knew where I lived. And whether he did or didn't, uh, just looked really, he had stepped in uh, mud, wet dirt. Yeah. And that's what left the shoe print on the concrete around my house where it shouldn't have been. How well did you sleep at night? <laughs> I mean, during that time, if, if um, um, very I, little. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, very little. I, at one point in time on July the 7th, uh, we had gone to, uh, I got a phone call. I, I woke up in the middle of the night and I was having nightmares. I was thinking, the guy's in the house. Now, my family's not with me tonight. Uh, and I had told my wife, don't you dare come home in the middle of the night yeah. right now because it's dangerous and I'm sleeping with my gun right here next to me. Yeah. And so I woke up in a cold sweat. I was nauseous and I felt subconsciously he's in my house. Mm. So I, I literally got up out of bed with my gun and I walked my house as if I was clearing a burglary. Yeah. And I didn't call the cops because I, it, I live in the sheriff's department jurisdiction and I'm, I'm saying to myself, if I call the cops and come out here and nobody's here, they're going to say, Oh, Gil's gone off the deep end. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I went ahead cleared the house myself, came back to bed, got in bed right after I got back in bed, turned the TV on and my phone rang, my house phone rang and it scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> yeah. And they said, you need to get down to uh, Linda Arthur who was in the documentary. She was working the crime lab at the time. Yes. And she says, so I called her up and she says, Gil, I think you ought to get down here. Uh, they just uh, raped the lady across the street from my house. And I think it's related to what you're working. So, so you just I, had a, you had a gut feeling about that. And just to, just to add, you, you mentioned the phone ringing. This is one of these old phones with a cord. This isn't our cell phone. Those things were loud. Yes. Yes. Back in the, the day. Yeah, yeah. No, no, this was a landline. Yeah. And, and just like a nurse, uh, when anything happens in my life, especially, uh, working as a homicide cop, mm. first thing, you, one of the first instincts is look at your watch. What time is it? Yeah. And that's just for documentation. Okay. Well, I looked at the clock and it's 3.30 in the morning. I'm saying, what the hell is he doing now? Right now, where's he at? Yeah. Well, yeah. The, the lady that got raped said he was sodomizing her at 3.30 in the morning. Jeez. And so I didn't wake up my partner because, you know, we're bone tired. Yeah. We're both yeah. exhausted. Mm. Linda was my friend her husband had gone through the academy with me we'd done so much together yeah and we used to double date and now she's calling me to go see this and her husband had just been murdered on june 1st a month before so now i don't know is she psychologically is this bothering her is it reaching out too much well she's my friend i better get down and talk to her yeah and i did yeah. not wake up my partner well, when I was done over there, uh, and she was a victim, a surviving victim of Richards. Yes. Uh, it's seven o'clock in the morning, and I called my wife up. She was at her parents' house. Okay. I called her up, and I said, hey, would you like to go out to breakfast? And she said, well, the, Gil, the kids are still asleep. And I said, I don't care. You can wake them up. Your parents, I know, are awake right now. And she said, yes. And so we went out to, I picked him up. We went out to breakfast, came back to her mom's house. And I asked her if she would wake me up. It's now 10 in the morning. And I said, wake me up at 1130. I need to, I need to go back to work. And yeah. she said, Gil, you, you can't do this. You're going to kill yourself. Mm. And I, and I snapped at her. I said, I just asked you to wake me up. You can't do it. I'll call the office. Yeah. And she said, okay. 
and didn't have to because I got one shoe off. And when I went to take the other one off, my beeper went off. Okay. And we used to use pagers at that time. Yeah. So my, my pager went off and I went ahead and called in. They said, you got another one back in Monterey Park. So there was another murder in Monterey Park. And what he had done, he had been to one house, hadn't satisfied his need for sex. He killed that lady less than a mile away. He went to Sophie Dickman's house, raped her, and then he escaped. Then he, then he got away. Jesus. So there wasn't much sleep at all during this time. He, um, yeah, it's, uh, I heard stories that uh, one actor, Todd Bridges, he was an actor from Different Strokes. Um, he was in jail at the time when Ramirez was there. And he actually, Ramirez used to scare him by shaking his cell, um, his cell doors and saying that he's going to get him. That, did, you hear, yeah, I, did you hear that? Yeah, story? I, I heard about Todd. Uh, I believe Sean Penn was also uh, in custody a couple of days. Oh, uh, okay. while he was there. Yeah. You know, while he was there. Mm. Jesus. So he was just an, and he, was he a big guy? Uh, that's one of the things my brother actually, uh, my brother actually asked me how, you know, was he an imposing figure? Um, yeah. Not, well, if, if you're a short person, I guess he would be. He was uh, built kind of funny. He was tall and thin, very slender. Yeah. Uh, when I say tall, he probably, I'm 6'3". So he's probably at least 6'2". Okay. But he, he had uh, a long torso, very thin at the waist, and he had long arms, and his hands were extremely large for, uh, I thought. Okay. They were big. Wow. He, um, yeah, I think the, the one thing that, that um, you know, why, why this case has also gotten so much press is he doesn't, he looks like what you'd imagine a serial killer will look like. I mean, Ted Bundy, Ted Bundy's a good looking guy. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer looks like someone that went to MIT, uh, you know, with all due respect to people that go to MIT. But um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Richard Ramirez, he, he just looked evil. Um, there was just something about him. He, he kind of, yeah, he, he fit the whole, the whole thing. Yeah, he he didn't. Uh, I you know people see that people say he just looked evil, yeah. and I I don't I don't see evil in people. I I just see the human, you know. And yes. it 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 really doesn't. When he got dressed up and cleaned up once in a while, uh, matter of fact, Sophie Dickman testified that he was quite the handsome young man. Yeah, I read he, that. Yeah. He, He'd pull his hair back into a ponytail with a black suit on, and he looked like a Miami dope dealer. <laughs> you know, he was he was right out of Miami Vice. He had those high cheekbones, so beauty's in the eye of the beholder. And I'm so sorry. he didn't he didn't uh, I didn't look at him as evil. I looked at him as being human. Well, in in my next question would be: Do you think? Uh, Serial killer. I, I, I think this question has been asked so many times before, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Um, do you think serial killers are born or made due to due to external circumstances? I knew. I know he had a a rough childhood. Um, you know, he slept in the cemetery to get away from his abusive dad. Uh, you know, stuff like that. You're absolutely right. That's that's one of the questions is asked um, very often. Yeah. And my my answer is quite simple. If I had the answer to that, I'd be a doctor making a lot more money than I was as a cop. <laughs> I have no idea. You know, my job wasn't to find out what made him like that. My job was to identify him, get him taken into custody, and then present the facts to the local authorities of this series. I, I don't yeah. know. I really don't know. I suppose you also don't really want to get too deep into what makes a guy like this tick. Um, no. Do you know I mean? all. That, that's, yeah. you, you, when I stop to think about it, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, there was two psychologists, one from the U UCLA and one from New York, that publicly in an article said essentially that I was full of hot air, that one man could not be responsible for everything that I was uh, trying to put on him. 
All right. Yeah, that just, okay. And so, so much for the professionals and the psychologists, the doctors mm. that are supposed to know. Yeah. One world renowned and one from UCLA. Well, you know, they were wrong and I was right. Well, so, huh? you know, I don't know uh, what makes these guys tick. I don't nor do I really I, care. I don't think this, uh, I, uh, to me personally, um, just to go into it, I don't think, uh, you know, I think an, indiv an individual makes his own choices. I mean, a lot of people sure. have had bad childhoods and they've, you know, they've made a success out of their lives. Other people have done the, you know, have done the exact opposite. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's a, you know, that it, I understand 100% what you're saying. I think the human mind is too complicated to be able to get a definitive blueprint of if this kid is raised this way, he will become this. Um, sure. I think there's so many external factors that definitely will play a part um, because everyone's different. Um, sure. That, and when you add the drugs, oh, that yeah. really plays a big, big part of it. Especially, yeah, because he, I mean, he was uh, the drug user. Uh, methamphetamines and cocaine uh, are not good for your brain. <laughs> They're really not. Yeah. And they bring on a lot of problems. You know, and, and, and I'm not saying mental problems. Last week, two weeks ago, we just had a California highway patrolman making a stop on a vehicle, and the guy immediately opened up a fire, hit it, hitting him. Now, he didn't die, but he was severely injured. And they caught the guy the same day. You know, they caught him a few hours later. And when you look at the guy and, you know, you're saying, what makes this guy go? Well, his family was then interviewed later on. And his family was apologizing mm -hmm. to, the, uh, to the officer's family, apologizing to everybody. And they were hoping that their brother, uh, they, they can't make excuses for him other than the fact that he came back like that from Afghanistan, from the war, oh, okay. and he's severely suffering from PTSD. Now, okay. if that is a legitimate veteran suffering from PTSD and he just went off the deep end, well, my heart goes out to the guy. You know, yeah. I'm sorry, you know, you, you can't do that. And we can't let him out in public like that. But there is some one side of me that just my heart goes out to him because I've been in combat. Yes. And so it, I, I do feel sorry for the guy, but you got to still take him into custody and keep him locked up so he can't hurt anybody else. No, definitely. Um, 100%. Uh, today, obviously, the world's changed a lot today with a lot of resources, um, you know, things like, uh, let's say, the internet, uh, certain forensic techniques that, that have come up, DNA testing, that sort of thing. How much, how much harder has it made it? And well, is there a decline in serial killers today because of advances in technology? I don't believe so. Okay. You know, uh, with social media and yes. new technology, mm. killers are just adapting mm. to what's out there. They're changing, you know, their mind. Back in the old Civil War and cowboy days, they did a lot of things at night and with a full moon, people say, oh, there's a full moon, a lot more activity. Well, they use that as light, light, light by the moon. Yeah. So they went along with the times. And, you know, then they had big, heavy guns. Now they got smaller guns. They have mm. silencers. They have modes of transportation. So what has happened is, and I was just at a conference uh, earlier in uh, the first week of May, with over 500, 5,000 uh, attendees from true crime. These are people that follow true crime. Yeah. And they're, they're not. These are just regular everyday people, uh, some lawyers, cops, uh, and people that are just enthusiasts. Okay. And they, I was talking to one young lady, and she was saying that she didn't believe there were that many serial killers. Uh, you know, working, it seems that that was a fad. They went through, you don't see them anymore. Yeah. And I, I said, I disagree with you. They've just found better ways and they're just getting along. And unfortunately, cops still haven't gotten along. You know, they some departments and I'll even I remember when I was working, mm -hmm. when you start talking about a serial killer, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to believe in it okay. because that means more money, more bodies, more media attention. More and pressure. They don't want to hear it. 
Yeah. Mm. So yeah. They, they don't want they don't want to get involved in it. So they wait. With the mobility of killers today, it's easy to kill in one state and then move to another state and do something else and you know, so on and so forth. So I said, I don't believe that. I believe there's serial killers out there that just haven't been caught. Mm. And then there was and, and I apologize to him right now. And as soon as I hang up with you, I'll, I'll say, oh, this was the guy's name. This was the gentleman that uh, made the DNA on the Golden State Killer, the old man that was uh, yes. killing up and down the state of California that was a yeah. former police officer. And so he's the guy that put that together and got the DNA and made the arrest. Now, he was out there. And he is quoted in the uh, New York Post. And he was there at the conference night. I spent time with him and he's quoted in the New York post as saying he believes there's at least 2000 minimal that are out there working right now. So I believe there are people out there working. Uh, it's a thrill. It's, I, I believe a lot of it is uh, sexually motivated and I don't mean sexual intercourse uh, in the true sense. I'm talking about they get their excitement over this they may not have sex with a person but this is exciting to them and that drives them it's a sexual yeah. deviant that's doing this stuff because look i think that i think that uh the the detective or investigator i think it was paul holes yes yes it was there you go yeah. okay i spent um, a lot of time with paul and i had done a documentary with paul before okay yeah i actually watched i watched that um documentary unmask well i think it's called unmasked um uh you know the hand the my hand for the golden state killer that was yeah. yeah i mean the advances in in technology now dna i think btk was one as well that i think he was yes. born in 2005 um also due to dna uh no that wasn't dna no, no that, was, he, that was a computer yes he, uh, <laughs> that was a computer he screwed up yes. on a computer and then they were able to they were able to make him i had been called back there by their task force okay uh, so That's I went right. back there and, and uh, they, I was due to go back there. And then about uh, three weeks before I'm due to go back there, that's when he was arrested. And I called him up and I said, well, I said, all bets are off. You don't need me. And they said, oh, no, no, we've got the arrest. We've still got to worry about prosecution. We definitely want you to come up here okay. still. And so went up there and said, so not only that, they had uh, put up a seminar and invited cops from around and I was going to be given instruction as their uh, course with your permission, Gil, we've also done this. We want you to talk at the seminar. Okay. And so that's what we did. Yeah, I think he got caught something with a printer. I think he was printing documents and sending into the police and they identified the, I think it's the IP address of the printer and his the, name was linked to it. Yeah. The yeah. IP address. He was using a computer at the church. Yes. And, yes. And he was a deacon at the church, and that's how they knew he was around there. And uh, he didn't think they could catch him because he, he said, Can you identify me by the computer? And they said, No, we can't. Well, that was just wrong. They knew they could. Mm. And so that's mm. what caused them to give it up. Wow. Um, the, the, other, the flip side of the coin with technology as well, where it, it could actually make things a lot easier. Well, it, serial killers today definitely have got information at their fingertips i mean crime shows like csi yeah i don't know how accurate it is but you know shows like forensic files that type of stuff it pretty much tells you indirectly sure. what to do and what not to do if the you're a do's and killer. don'ts sure yeah sure it's the do's and don'ts it's right there and that's why i say uh they're staying up with technology they're staying up with everything well definitely you know, not, richard uh, Sorry, carry on. Richard only left a uh, fingerprint by accident on the last car that he used. Yes. He never left prints any anyplace else. Yeah. I remember um, the other thing is with regards to to the internet. Um, I don't, I still today don't believe, and I speak about it in other podcasts as well. I don't believe the internet is regulated as it should be. I'm not a massive fan of social media. I kind of miss the old days where you know, you had to phone someone or send a postcard or whatever the case may be. Um, I, I think the internet is dangerous in a way. Um, I mean, well, as kids, we were told not to talk to strangers. 
then with the internet we were told also you know don't interact with strangers on social media or the internet or whatever and then you know and today we have uber which combines sure. both of them <laughs> so, yeah it's a it's an interesting it's it's an interesting time um i mean especially for kids who have got all of the i mean they've got so much at their you know at their disposal today which you know if it isn't regulated correctly it it could become well dangerous in my opinion well i don't know that's that that's way above my pay grade you know? <laughs> I, i'm just part of the reactionary force that's and i'm not chat. even that, part of that anymore that's the chat for that that's a chat for at the bar yeah that's right <laughs> gil listen one more thing i just want to touch on um i just want to definitely just mention it she was she was featured in the uh, documentary as well and this is someone who is extremely inspiring to me in an age where you know people are glorified and nothing against the following you know people i'm going to mention but people like the kardashians the paris hiltons of the world all these people that are supposedly inspiring i mean to me anastasia ronas is i mean it's it's insane i don't have words how inspiring you know what she's gone through and i've heard that she's lived uh, you know she's gone on to live an, a great life uh she has kids. She has a family. I mean, to me, that is that is inspiring. Um, yeah, she is. When I met her the first time, when she was a little girl, yeah, uh, she was the most beautiful, most intelligent, brightest young little girl mm. that I had ever met. Yes. I had three children myself. She's beautiful. She grew up to be beautiful. After I retired, her mother had seen a piece of the local media had done on me on television mm. and she, she reached out. We talked on the phone. I cried. She had me in tears um, yeah. because I, I just never wanted to follow up on any of the little kids because yeah. I love children. And I didn't want to hear that they were psychologically, uh, they had gone wrong, Hard, they had yeah. gone bad. Yeah. And she said that they watched me through my career and they went ahead every time I'd come out on TV. They'd run to the, they would run to the television, and it's almost like, hey, it's Uncle Gil. And I'd get on TV, and they'd watch me, and then she wanted to thank me for treating her daughter as if she were my own. Mm. And before you know, it, we're, I was crying. It, it was just so heartwarming. When they dropped the documentary, you know, I told them in the beginning I would not help them get in touch with any of the yeah. uh, victims because. Yeah. They had been through enough, and I wasn't going to help their cause by re-traumatizing them. Mm. Well, they found her. They reached out to her. Next thing I know, they're asking me to call her up that she wanted to speak with me. Wow. And we spoke. And she said, I've wanted to talk to you for years. But I was six years old then, and I'm, I kept saying over the years, what am I going to talk to her about? I yeah. really don't have much and so again we cried yeah and then she i told her don't do this documentary for me or for anyone mm. you do it because if you think it's right for you then do it if not don't worry about it well they called me back and they said she wants to do it but she wants you on the set so I went down to where she was doing. And again, first time I'd seen her since she was six years old and we embraced and I cried I to see her go from the six year old little girl to the beautiful adult that she is. And we still remain. I, I mean, we remain very close. I talked to her. Uh, matter of fact, I, I have to send her uh, a message uh, today because her only downfall in life yeah. is that she's not a Dodger fan. <laughs> and, you know, she's a big fan of a rival team. And I won't mention <laughs> where, because I don't want to give away where she's, where she lives. Sure. Yeah. But, but we, we have a friendly rivalry going on and she's just a wonderful lady, beautiful children, wonderful husband. I've met them all uh i got to see mom and dad again so it's it's 
it's very it's, rewarding. It's full circle. Yeah, just don't get choked up because then I'm going to start crying because I'm a you know I love kids as well and I get emotional about yeah. them. This whole this whole podcast is going to be a mess. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, Gil, it's 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 absolutely remarkable the the life that you've led, the lives that you've saved, and um, I mean, like I said, you know. Uh, to hell with celebrities and all of this glorified stuff that they've done nothing against them by the way but i mean to me people like you people like anastasia i mean you guys are what's truly inspiring uh you know in the world today which is chaotic by itself um thank you so i just want to say thank you very much for the time i really really appreciate it uh the six-year-old inside of me that watched that movie with my mom back in i think 1990 Thanks you for, for, make, for, making, for making the world a safer place. Um...